Like love, dislike happens at first sight and just as causeless. Maybe this feeling arises at the level of chemical elements. I work in a network of hypermarkets, middle-level management. There are no personnel under my command. I mainly contact the external environment, and what happens inside the hypermarket almost does not concern me. After announcing my relationship with the saleswoman Tina, I wasn't afraid. I didn't flaunt it, of course, but I didn't hide it either. She's not my subordinate. But everyone already knew that we have been together for an hour and are planning a wedding. Not that anyone is particularly interested in this, but girls are such girls, Tina once secretly told one colleague, then also secretly to another. Third, in short, the result is predictable. The entire female part of the team knows. I think that if it weren't for my fiancé's unruly things, our relationship would have remained unclear for a long time. She comes to work before me on time and leaves earlier. Tina is cute. She has a good face and figure. Everything was always good in our relationship. We never quarreled, and we had sex almost every night. And then we had Keith. He got a job as a warehouse worker, engaged in loading and unloading, taking goods to the hall. At first glance, an ordinary guy, an ordinary face, sporty, a head taller than me and much wider in the shoulders. And he was very fond of women. Very soon it became known that he flirted with almost all the girls and women in the store, flirted wildly and very successfully. This could be judged by the fact that one or the other saleswoman began to spend more time with him, left work with him together. And after some time, suddenly everything ended, and all communication between Keith and his passion was abruptly cut off. It wouldn't have bothered me, and I wouldn't have paid attention to it, if it weren't for the fact that Kit didn't like me right away. He got into the habit of teasing me at every convenient opportunity, on occasion and without occasion, on any trifle. These teasings were not such as to cause a confrontation, but when he made jokes and quips in the presence of other people, I always felt uncomfortable. And, as it happens, I know in many people, later, in solitude, scrolling through the memory of a conversation with him, I found witty answers, expressed them there, I would embarrass him. But these witty answers came to my head much later. He could say, seeing my polished shoes, that it seems that the only physical exercise that I can do is bending over with a shoe brush, could poke him in passing about my musical taste, provoked the approving laughter of colleagues. And what does he say somehow, when I was talking on the phone, shifting from foot to foot, he blurted out to the saleswomen that if I really want to go to the toilet and I'm afraid I won't be able to run, Adult diapers are in the hygiene department. And all the girls who were nearby giggled. Even Tina. Damn it, I'm probably slow thinking. It never once occurred to me to answer him decently. And thank God that I didn't try to answer. There is nothing more ridiculous and pitiful than being asked seriously to answer veiled jokes. I began to avoid crossing with him. And if he came across my path, I tried to change direction, go around. He seems to have understood it. In any case, he began to find himself in unexpected places, and his nasty jokes were indispensable. And then he found out about our relationship with Tina. I noticed several times how he was talking to her when there were no customers, and he was taking a cart with goods into the hall. He was apparently joking and flirting, and Tina laughed and twirled her curls with her fingers, exactly the way she used to spin when we just started talking to her. Tina, I told her that evening, we need to talk. And I told her about the hidden bullying that Keith is doing, about his reputation as a lover, finally, about the fact that he seems to be targeting her. I spoke frankly and really hoped for understanding. Tina, I told her, I'm asking you to stop all communication with him. You can call me paranoid, but I feel that he intends to do some kind of mischief. Just don't think that I don't trust you, no? I love you and trust you completely, but Keith, do you know that he has already seduced several girls from our store? It seems that this is such a sport for him. Baby, what are you doing? My bride looked at me pityingly. I love you and I will not allow him any liberties. Don't even think about it. You have nothing to fear. She said that and I should have calmed down. But I thought that the best thing would be to tell her that she would no longer communicate with him at all. And that she would finally tell him why. The next day I was walking down the main avenue of the store and saw Tina and Keith. They were standing pretty far away from her department. He was saying something to her and she was giggling. I know sign language, not thoroughly, but I've learned some of the poses and gestures in marketing books. Her posture was open, 
The toes of her shoes were invitingly turned up. Her shoulders were visibly back, clearly showing off her already large breasts. And she held the wrist of the other hand with one hand, showing him the palm of her hand. There was a decent distance between them, but at that moment, I realized that she was no longer mine. Her posture could be described in one short word. Yes. I didn't let it show, I walked on by. I saw them talking three more times that day, all three times in different parts of the sales floor, but each time far from her department. There was no overt action, no movement, no hugging, much less kissing, just talking. But each time her postures expressed explicit prior consent. How did I observe them? I just came into the security room with a premium bag of chips bought at our own store. I told the guard that I mixed up the flavor, bought a huge bag, and now I don't know what to do with it, and I thought I saw him eating the chips. The guard excitedly confirmed that he really liked chips. I gave him the open packet, and as if in between said that I was preparing a marketing campaign and would like to see the behavior of customers. He gratefully allowed me to enter the observation room several times, and I, repeatedly entering, pretending with a clever look that I was writing something down on my smartphone, watched Tina and Keith. It was all a foregone conclusion. No, I tried to talk to Tina again that evening, but the conversation ended almost immediately after she blatantly lied to me about not talking to Keith today. I didn't know what to say anymore. I could say that I'd seen them, that she'd lied, but what good would it do? The line hadn't been crossed yet, and if I told her everything I knew, it might make her more cunning. There was a small chance she'd still resist, so I kept my mouth shut. I just waited, faintly hoping for that chance. Not that I was spying on Tina, but yeah, I did a little spying. When she left for work an hour earlier than me in the morning, I'd run into the store, go to security, mention in passing the research on customer behavior in the early hours, and watch Tina or Keith on the monitors. And I also tried to surround her with special care and attention and love, and talked a lot about the upcoming wedding, the future. Well, at least I tried. She didn't come home from work on Saturday, or at least when I got home an hour after she was supposed to, she was gone. Just a text message about going out with her friends late at night. Basically, I figured it out. There was no proof, of course, but somehow I knew right away. And then there was proof. Keith sent it to me in the form of a link to a video in his cloud. Keith turned his phone camera around and smirking into the lens showed me, and I was sure he was filming the whole action just for me, his middle finger. Then the camera showed her again, and I saw him flick her nose lightly, getting her attention, and she looked up, sort of indignant, but not seriously laughing, the way girls get indignant when they're teased and actually like it. Hey, we'll watch this video later and remember the good times, I heard his voice. Come on, give me a smoochy smoochy. And she smilingly raised two fingers in the shape of the letter V and then stretched out her lips in a kissing motion. Although she didn't seem to know that her lover was going to send the video to someone, it looked like she was showing it to me. It was over. I mean, between me and her, and they were still going at it. As embarrassing as it is to admit, I couldn't tear myself away from the spectacle and watched to the end. So, I heard his panting voice, am I better than him? Better, she answered with a laugh. Tomorrow I'll fuck you at work. We'll have time before he comes. Uh, it's dangerous at work, she tried to object, but he slapped her lightly on the cheek and said, I'll decide when and where, you're mine now. It felt weird. I felt terribly hurt and somehow ashamed. I opened the closet and started shoveling out her clothes. About an hour later, I brought three boxes and a bag of her things to her parents' house, unloaded them at the door, rang the doorbell, and quickly ran for cover, waited for the door to open, and leaving her surprised father to look at the things, hurried away. I returned home, took out the bottle of gin she had given me months ago and had not drunk, and was about to uncork it. But suddenly a funny plan occurred to me. Keith would be grinning in my face at work in the morning, hoping that I wouldn't dare to admit publicly that I'd become a cuckold, much less pick a fight with him. And he'll probably brag about his victory to a couple of his colleagues, maybe even show them the video. And behind my back, there'll be whispers and giggles both from those to whom he'll present the evidence and from those who'll enjoy the rumors. So where does that leave me? Quit and go far away? but I had a plan in my head. I turned off the phone, turned off the doorbell, closed the door, 
and went to bed with improvised earplugs in my ears. So I didn't hear the knock on the door when she came back, or her screams. I didn't even know how long she had been trying to get into the apartment, and then the neighbors told me that her hysterics at the door lasted more than an hour until she went somewhere, and I didn't care where she spent the night. And in the morning, I arrived at work, leaving my car a block away just in case, entered the hall with a paper bag and immediately met Keith, who was predictably waiting for me, surrounded by several of his fellow loaders and saleswomen. They were all looking at me curiously, some mockingly, some sympathetically, but curiosity was evident in their gazes, and I lived up to their expectations. Keith, I thought I gave a rather natural portrayal of joy. Thank you, you helped me out. This is for you, drink it, you can even drink it with my ex. I smiled widely, taking the bottle out of the bag. Hey, it's not from our store. I brought it from home, everyone's a witness. Keith, honestly, I don't know. I don't know how long I've been hesitating to break up with her, but my conscience has been bothering me. How can I? She doesn't give me a reason if I tell her now that I don't like her anymore, that I'm sick of her. I'll think I'm such an asshole. And when I realized that you were hitting on her, I was so afraid to scare you off. I pretended not to notice. I was afraid that you'd figure out my intentions and wouldn't want to be an obedient executor of my plan. But you did a great job. You did a great job. What? He slammed his eyes shut. What are you talking about? What plan? Well, I pretended to be surprised. You really didn't guess? Are you really so, er, clueless? I pretended to choose a less offensive word. That you didn't understand why I didn't try to stop your, e, affair. Keith, darling, I've wanted to break up with her for a long time. You know that, don't you? She was out of my league, as they say. We were living together but I felt like Michael Jordan playing against a backyard team. And I wanted to run away, but I didn't want to look like an asshole, not in her eyes, but in the eyes of the people around me. And even here, all of you, I glanced around at the crowd of onlookers, would think I was like that. And now I have the perfect excuse to break up, and I've already done it, and you helped me do it. I looked around at the audience, who were eager to hear what was going on. Did you hear that? I'm breaking up with her because she cheated on me, and no one dares to call me an asshole and an autocrat. I'm not getting rid of her for no reason. There was laughter, and the girls started to discuss what had happened, and I noticed that his partner, who was standing next to Keith, was holding his phone in his hand. It had a distinctive themed case, and on the screen was the video that Keith had sent me yesterday. Oh, by the way, I exclaimed, did everyone watch the video? Let me see. I took Jack's cell phone and the guy let it out of my hand. Now you have to see this. I felt a lot of excitement and trembling in my hands when I clicked on the icon in the folder. My fingers were not very obedient. I didn't realize that I had highlighted many files at once. I highlighted send to all contacts in the menu that popped up and clicked OK. Now, now, I mumbled, trying to pass the time and looking at the rotating loading circle. It's ready. Oh, I think I clicked the wrong thing, I said. Now it's right, and I clicked play. Poor Keith. In one minute, his triumph had become a farce. What's more, after I had done what I had done, I suddenly realized that along with the video of my fiancé turning from my fiancé to my ex-fiancé, other video files had been sent to all of Keith's contacts, and who knows what was in them. I was holding Keith's phone in my hand, showing the video to everyone, and everyone was staring at it avidly, when suddenly I heard several shrieks almost simultaneously. Did you send the video to all your contacts? With horror in her voice shouted one of the salesgirls looking at her phone. All of them and my husband? Fake! Another girl moaned after her. And mine? The five girls were hysterical a minute later, cursing at me and Keith. It all made sense. In this folder in his cloud, Keith kept other videos similar to the one that was playing for all the colleagues present, which were filmed his other passions, among them married ones. Oh, Keith turned out to be a catcher, as they say, did not miss a single skirt. The most interesting thing was that by the nature of his work, he had contacts of almost all the employees of the store and even some members of their families. And at these very minutes, these family members could already be watching the video and be unpleasantly surprised to learn something new about their wives and daughters.
But even if not everyone had seen the videos, there would surely have been someone to notify them. I didn't see my ex until around lunchtime. She was pale and her eyes were red. When I met her eyes, I saw horror in them. I think it wasn't horror at me. I think it was horror at the whole thing. Everyone shunned her. Only a couple of the women who were hysterical about the videos sent to their husbands talked to her about something. The next day, Keith didn't go to work, and by lunchtime, the rumor was that he'd been beaten up badly by some hooligans, very badly. And he might not come back to work after he got out of the hospital. Broken limbs take a long time to heal. And several saleswomen went to work with a thick layer of makeup on their faces, and the makeup could not hide the deep sadness on their faces, enhanced by the bright shadows under their eyes.